Welcome to Trail Talk here on LTTV. I'm Chris Ford. I'm the Director of Marketing for Lincoln Trail College and Illinois Eastern Community Colleges. And I'm joined by Dr. Zahi Atala, the President of Lincoln Trail College. Zahi, how are you today? I am doing fantastic. As, as you and I have been talking about, this week is, is commencement. And uh, for us, it's, it's the culmination of the hard work of our students and the faculty and the staff, so it is happy time for us. And of course, we congratulate every graduate at Lincoln Trail and elsewhere in the nation. Absolutely, an exciting time of year when we get to say goodbye to one class. And uh, as you said, congratulations to our class of 22. But this is also an exciting edition of Trail Talk because Zahi, uh, you had the opportunity to sit down and talk with the executive director of the Illinois Community Colleges Board. Indeed, I had the opportunity of uh, talking with Dr. Brian Durham about the future of community colleges, especially as, uh, as he sees them from the perspective of his legislative work, the work with the various uh, Illinois uh, politicians, but also on the national scheme what he sees coming down the pike for us as well as uh, the opportunities that we may want to seize on. All right, well Zahi, let's go ahead and, and check out your interview with Dr. Durham. Good morning, Dr. Durham. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us at Lincoln Trail uh, on our trail talk. Uh, could you please introduce yourself to the folks that who don't know you. I know who you are and, and I know how critical you are for success uh, every single day within Illinois Community Colleges, but could you please introduce the folks to who you are and, and what you do for us? Sure. Well, and, you know, first let me say thanks for having me. I'm happy to, to have an opportunity to have a conversation and always excited to be able to connect with um, college leaders and share a message from the state uh, with um, students and faculty and community members. So I'm Brian Durham, and I'm the executive director of the Community College Board. And just for a little bit of context, the Community College Board is the coordinating board for the 48 community colleges in the state. Um, we have our main office in Springfield. Um, we do a lot of um, advocacy for the system. We provide all the state funding to the system. We do things like recognition. You know, we work on a variety of different reforms and implement legislation. I work very closely with the uh, college presidents and others on my team work with chief academic officers and and chief student service officers and faculty. And, you know, so we're, we're really threaded pretty uh, well throughout the system and connected uh, to all the work, all the good work that the community colleges do out uh, for our students. So with your position comes uh, uh, an understanding and an appreciation of what legislators, what the economy is looking for from community colleges. Uh, could you please uh, tell us a little bit more about how you think the future of community colleges is looking uh, like? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, as I'm sure folks are aware, um, you know, we've had a trend of decline in enrollment for a number of years in community colleges and COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic did uh, a lot to aggravate that situation for um, community colleges. But I do think we have to, you know, look to how flexible and how responsive we were throughout COVID and really see some opportunities um, going forward. And in many of those ways, I think that's how community colleges become um, or remain even more dispensable. Uh, community colleges in Illinois, I'll tell you, are the number one workforce training provider in the state, and that's even with enrollment numbers going down. Um, we have about 4,000 current technical education programs in the state. Um, every community college certainly has a transfer degree or two, an AA and a, an AS program. Um, you have countless articulation agreements. You know, so we're serving uh, um, our students from a variety of different angles. I see uh, a, a few areas, you know, with all that said, that community colleges are going to um, have to be flexible. And I think you're going to see some shift over time. And I, I expect Lincoln Trail, like all other institutions, is experiencing some of this. One of those is there is an increasing demand for workforce training. 
um, and partnerships with industry and partnerships with um, you know various employers. Um, and we this is business we've done for a long time, but I, I'm talking about really um, sort of a re-emphasis, if you will, on some of the non-credit training and some customized training and some of those things that I think we did really well 20 years ago. And, um, you know, I, I see that sort of trend coming back. Um, and then on the, what I'll say on the credit side of the house, for career technical educators and transfer educators, um, a, as institutions, we have to look at our delivery models and have to think about how we can be flexible and how we can meet the needs of students where they are. Um, you know, the average age of a community college student is about 25, 27, you know, typically working. Most community college students work in some way, um, you know, often trying to upskill. You know, they're trying to get a short term credential. Um, and so we've really got to think beyond the traditional semester based model and look at opportunities for um, eight week courses, weekend cohorts, evening courses. I mean, there's just a variety of high flex models. You know, one of the things that came out of COVID is you you saw um, everybody shifted and pivoted to online and then we've pivoted back a little, yes. you know, but you've still got some online, you got some hybrids out there that are working really well. Um, you know, certainly you saw some of the, and I know faculty will be familiar with kind of the flipped classroom concept, you know, where you're doing YouTube videos and sharing lectures in a particular way, and then they're coming in for labs. I mean, I, I think everything's on the table as we think about delivery methods, competency-based education. Um, and I do think for us to remain the number one workforce provider in the state and nationally, you know, in the same um, vein, we do have to think about how we deliver instruction and what we do to meet the needs of students. And of course, you have a growing realization that colleges have a role to play in mental health as well. Um, now, you know, whether that is through partnerships or providing those kind of services on campus, I mean, I think that's that's really for institutions to think about. But COVID has also highlighted the fact that we have challenge, you know, students have challenges and and um, need to have their mental health needs addressed also. And so I think it behooves college to think about good partnerships in that space as well. So I'll stop there because I could go on and on. No, that's that's um, phenomenal. Just to especially the comparison that you gave to prior to COVID, how we shifted in COVID and how we need to continue considering some of the learnings from uh, COVID. You talked about competency-based education. Uh, where where are we at in this state? Because it takes a lot of effort. It takes rethinking the way we instruct. Flexibility, you know, we can, it's on our scheduling in many ways. Eight weeks is, you know, same number of minutes and sure. hours. Um, seat time is, is uh, covered, but competency-based flip classroom require a, perhaps a shift in thinking how how do you think uh, your agency will help us learn and grow mm -hmm. well it, there are a few considerations in the competency based space i mean i think that um in my conversation with um other presidents and accreditors i do see some some growing flexibility in the on the accreditation side um or a realization that accreditors have to open up to competency-based models. Um, I think they have a ways to go, and I think that's probably our biggest barrier to get away from the seat time model, even in a competency-based um, approach. Um, but with that said, we've got a number of colleges that have approved competency-based programs. I mean, um, what Lewis and Clark Community College, for example, has a welding program that's competency-based. Um, but they're figuring out how to thread it into, you know, kind of the existing model. So there's, you know, there's still some room for growth there. We we just released um, and funded a couple of colleges to do competency-based education down in your neck of the woods, Ren Lake um, mm -hmm. College, for example, got one of these grants. And um, But we've got a ways to go. I mean, certainly as a state, um, one of my goals is to get every college to be offering at least one competency-based education program and start this learning process to figure out if it works and what, you know, what does and doesn't. And, and we're looking at ways that we can 
um, help uh, support colleges in doing that. Um, I think one of the things we have to do, and, and this is really from from both an agency point of view and a system point of view, is kind of do a better job of taking stock of where we are. You know what what colleges are out there that are thinking about it, what are who are doing it, who does it well in Illinois, who does it well across the country, so we can learn from them. You know. Um, and ultimately to move that forward. So, you know, I see a lot of potential in competency-based education. I do think we need um, accreditors to, and and for that matter, the Department of Education to open up more in this space as well that will grant some of the flexibility that colleges need to get us here. So uh, you you alluded to our geographic uh, area here. Uh, We are part of the state that's uh, losing in terms of population. Uh, Crawford County, where Lincoln Trail is, has lost six and a half percent between the 2010 and 2020 censuses. Um, So flexibility is going to be important. Uh, What uh, you and I can't do a whole lot to increase population numbers, but but from a state perspective, would that uh, is that something that uh, could be worked on through grants and funding. Uh, is there a carrot for us somewhere? Uh, because, as you alluded to, it's uh, it's a lot of work, and many of us become comfortable uh, in the way we've done things. Uh, like you, you just uh, asked us to rethink our uh, developmental education. Uh, you know, it was a legislative mandate, and and you asked us as a fla- this week to have the plan ready. So you are in many ways helping us think, but on the other issues, mm. what do you think we can do and how can you help us uh, really think it? Yeah, I mean, well, some people might see it as help, others might not see it quite as help, right? But but we're, <clears throat> we're certainly enforcing um, what the General Assembly has asked for and on many of the reforms that you'd see, like the dev ed, I mean, I think ICCB really led the way for a number of years before we got to the point of it being a General Assembly initiative. Um, we had worked with the president's do placement testing. You know, we had um, have worked on a, uh, a multiple measures policy. I mean, we certainly um, worked to implement co-requisite remediation and other and also supporting other evidence-based models out there as well you know on the on the recruitment front i i would say that um the the number one competitor that community colleges have out there it's not universities it's not private institutions it's students who choose not to go anywhere you know and i think that there is you know from an institutional point of view there has to be a strategic plan conversation um, and a strategic conversation generally about how do you reach those students? You know, what 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 are you doing in recruitment that's new and innovative? What are you looking around the country at recruitment models that work? And are and you know, beyond recruitment, how are you retaining students? You know, how are you keeping those students who may come in and decide? You know, after a semester, they don't want to continue or they have challenges. I mean, so there's a real need for and I think a lot of colleges do this well, just by the way, you know, it's not to say that colleges aren't doing it, including Lincoln Trail. But there, you know, there's got to be consideration of wraparound student services. Um, I think coaching models and transition coordinator type models um, are effective for retention and can be helpful and effective in helping with recruitment. You know, so you've kind of got a double-edged uh, sword there to consider. How do you reach those students locally that aren't going or, you know, are not not going on to school? And then how do you also keep students in? Obviously, partnership with K-12 is huge, critical. You know, all those students are in K-12, and we tend to work very well on dual credit. But there's a whole other, you know, set of students that also the college has to figure out how to reach and I think there's opportunities for partnerships there also. So I, I want to go back to uh, the DERA uh, mandate and, and, and looking at things. It's 2022, but states that surround us, some of the states have had those initiatives and they've been successful for a long time. Do you think we 
we need the uh, legislators to tell us what to do or 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 and it's probably a loaded question but but you know or or do you think we have opportunities to rise ourselves and meet what our students and our population and our taxpayers uh, need well I, what i would say is i would my hope would be that when the General Assembly passes a law like the Developmental Ed Reform Act, that colleges are able to look at that and sort of shrug because they're already doing it, you know, and say, ah, oh, no big deal. We're already working on co-requisite remediation. We're already working to implement evidence-based models. I mean, I think the General Assembly plays a critical role um, in moving reforms forward. Um, my philosophy and approach has always been Let's try to be out ahead of those movements and have the structure ready for if we end up with a, a law that drives a particular reform, um, that we've already been practicing that that approach for many years and that we're informing that legislation and those decisions, not just reacting to those. You know, and I think that's that's really for me the key is that we've got to stay on top of the um, what's working. And I don't mean to say on every reform willy-nilly without looking to see if it works. I mean, there's strong evidence that developmental education reform in the form of co-requisite remediation, um, in the form of multiple measures placement, you know, there's strong evidence that that stuff works. Using GPA for placement, there's evidence that this works. Um, I, I recognize that often in Illinois, we have to do it the Illinois way. And, you know, you want to look at... Uh, in your own community, you want to see what works with GPA. You want to test these and look at the data, and I encourage that. But I, you know, largely like to stay out ahead of those things so that we're, you know, in a position to say, uh, here's what we're already doing. Let's help inform what any new law might look like. Uh, my, my last question. Um, I know you're a busy person. Um, is uh, do you see? A closer alignment with four years, like in some other states where the two year and the four year are within the same structure. I understand we have the higher education board here, but perhaps a closer alignment. And do you see possibilities for two year colleges ever getting the opportunity of granting in certain areas uh, four year degrees? It would be helpful for rural Illinois. But what's from your prism? What's the uh, where is our future looking like? What is well, like? well, I think that there's lots of really good partnerships out there. And I, you know, thanks to the Pritzker administration and their support for a budget increase and this just huge layout of funding to help students in short term credentials for MAP and, you know, more money for base operating and equalization. I think it puts us in a really good place to think about partnerships. I mean, often when you know, you go back a few years when we were in the budget impasse, uh, everybody was looking inward. You know, we were thinking about how do we keep going? How do we support our institution? How do we support our students in the midst of all this? Bringing more resources to the table, I think, opens up a variety of delivery options. I can't say whether the General Assembly or the governor or, you know, universities, community colleges are going to ever figure out this issue around the applied baccalaureate. Um, but I think more broadly, we have to look at every opportunity for partnership with our four-year institutions. And, you know, certainly uh, that's a lever that I think community colleges can use to go to four years and say, we need a baccalaureate completion program on X campus. How do we work together to get that? You know, we want to build stronger articulation. How do we work together to get that. I mean, I think there's lots, lot, there are, and you know, you guys have a ton of uh, these articulation agreements yes. with your local um, universities and others, uh, you know, up and down the state. Um, so there's a lot of really strong partnerships out there. And I don't think they're mentioned often enough, frankly, because I, I think it's, um, you know, partnerships are a lot better than sometimes they're portrayed. Well, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to talk to me, and I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of students that come through community colleges in Illinois for all you do on our behalf uh, and our faculty and staff. Uh, we can't thank you enough. It's it, you know, you're in Springfield every day trying to protect us, and and we're grateful for all you do. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you, and um, 
Uh, I know graduation is just right around the quarter. Commencement. Next Friday. So, yeah. So um, good luck with that. And congratulations to all the folks and at Lincoln Trail and at Illinois Eastern that are graduating um, this coming uh, week. So yes. good to talk with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. And you have a great day, sir. You too. Zahi, great interview with Dr. Brian Thank you. Durham. Uh, very exciting to hear his perspective on community colleges in Illinois and the future of, of community colleges in Illinois. As, as we've been talking about a community college month last month in April, mm -hmm. and uh, now, you know, another perspective on that. Absolutely. And, and he shed uh, some light. Nothing that if we've kept up with the literature that we wouldn't have perhaps cleaned, uh, uh, but, but at the same time, what are the pressing issues and what are those horizons by which we, we need to be rethinking some of the ways we've operated? Of course, not everything, and, and you know, that is not to say that we're not doing a wonderful job, but there are certain realities that have happened and are gonna be happening for all of us in this nation. Well, Zahi, I know as we have continued to talk about uh, the benefits and the value of community colleges. You're working on getting some other exciting interviews. Yes. We don't want to give away too much, but obviously this has been a great series for people that have had the opportunity to listen to this. And certainly over the, the coming weeks and, and months, we'll have more great interviews mm -hmm. like this one with uh, Dr. Durham from the ICCB. So uh, that will do it for this week's edition of Trail Talk. Again, congratulations to the class of 2022, uh, graduating our 52nd annual commencement exercises mm -hmm. this week. Uh, if you enjoy Trail Talk, if you enjoy shows like this, uh, be sure and like this video, subscribe to our channel, ring the bell so you get notifications when we post uh, anything on our YouTube channel, and be sure and like us on our other social media platforms as well. So for Dr. Atala, I'm Chris Ford. We'll see you next time on Trail Talk on LTTV.